Systemic lupus erythematosus is a systemic chronic autoimmune disorder. Systemic means that lupus affects practically all systems in our body. Chronic means that most of the time lupus remains in the chronic phase. From time to time acute flares occur when symptoms become more severe, but then acute flare resolves and disease again enters into the chronic phase. Acute flare we also call relapse of systemic lupus erythematosus. Lupus has three major pathogenic mechanisms. The first one is production of autoantibodies. Mostly it's anti-nuclear antibodies, anti-double-stranded DNA antibodies, anti-Smith antibodies and antiphospholipid antibodies. The second pathogenic mechanism is related to hyperactivation of complement system. This causes depletion of C3, C4 complement components. And production of autoantibodies and activation of complement system results in formation of immune complexes, and their progressive deposition in tissues cause severe injury. So why lupus develops? Practically all cells in our organism in normal condition die by apoptosis. During the apoptosis, cellular membrane and nucleus undergo fragmentation that results in formation of so-called apoptotic debris. The major problem with apoptotic debris is high immunogenicity. In normal condition, nuclear material is contained inside the cell under the nuclear membrane. But with apoptosis, now fragmented nuclear material becomes exposed. The only solution to this problem is to quickly remove immunogenic material. And the clearance of apoptotic debris is provided by macrophages that as quickly as possible remove apoptotic debris from the blood by phagocytosis and destroy it. But sometimes some pathogenic factors can significantly increase the rate of apoptosis. In this case, with increase in apoptosis, the formation of apoptotic debris increase. In response to this, clearance of apoptotic debris should increase. But if there is something wrong with phagocytosis, and clearance of apoptotic debris is also disrupted, then we have a huge problem. Because now the amount of apoptotic debris in the blood greatly increase. In this case, apoptotic debris undergo phagocytosis by antigen-presenting cells in various tissues of our organism, including synovial tissue. But in this case, they do not destroy apoptotic debris but instead they present apoptotic debris on MHC2 receptor to T helpers. The logic is that antigen-presenting cells want to know, is apoptotic debris normal material for our organism, or it's something pathogenic? T helpers scan apoptotic debris, and because apoptotic debris is composed mostly of nuclear material, they think that it's antigen. Because nuclear material normally is hidden inside the nucleus, they have never encountered this molecule before. In response to any antigen, T helpers becomes activated. Once T helper becomes activated, T helper, by production of interleukin 6 and interferon gamma, activate B lymphocytes. If B lymphocytes become activated, they begin to produce antibodies against nuclear material in the apoptotic debris. First of all, they produce antibodies against nucleus. We call them antinuclear antibodies, or ANA. In addition to this, B lymphocytes begin to produce antibodies against DNA molecule. We call them anti-double-stranded DNA antibodies and anti-Smith antibodies. Antibodies can activate complement system with formation of immune complexes. And deposition of immune complexes in tissues cause severe damage to tissues. Also T helpers, by production of interleukin 6, activate T killers. And in activated state T killers can cause severe damage to tissues. And also one of the antibodies that B lymphocytes begin to produce do not target nuclear material in the apoptotic debris, but instead they target phospholipids. We call them antiphospholipid antibodies, and they play a crucial role in antiphospholipid syndrome. One of the most important concepts 
is that initially disease is in silent phase. But we have some factors that can trigger lupus. Most commonly it's ultraviolet light, smoking and drugs. All of them can increase the rate of apoptosis and thereby the production of apoptotic debris. And the higher the amount of apoptotic debris, the higher is the chance that macrophages will consume and present fragmented nuclear material to T helpers. Thereby, the higher is the chance of T helpers activation. With activation, T helpers stimulate B lymphocytes and T lymphocytes, and this will result in massive tissue damage. So, actually, we have three major pathogenic factors. It's autoantibodies, immune complexes, and T killers. The position of immune complexes in the glomeruli, in combination with anti-double-stranded DNA antibodies, cause severe damage to podocytes and glomeruli capillaries. We call this condition lupus nephritis. And the major feature of lupus nephritis is proteinuria, greater than 0.5 grams in 24 hours. So here we see images of glomeruli. The principle here is that we add anti-immunoglobulin G antibodies that have green color under the microscope and they bind to immune complexes so together they form one massive complex that have green color. So on these images immune complexes will have a bright green color. On first image we see massive deposition of immune complexes in the Bowman capsule. On the second image, also massive deposition of immune complexes in the mesanglial matrix. Also, deposition of immune complexes can provoke hyaline thrombosis. And we see here hyaline thrombi. And on last image, we see subendothelial deposition of immune complexes. So basically, once immune complexes are formed, they can accumulate practically everywhere and in massive quantities. Deposition of immune complexes in the blood-brain barrier cause severe damage to a barrier and this results in increase in permeability. So now a lot of pro-inflammatory cytokines and immune cells enter into the brain tissue where they cause neuronal death and progressive neuronal death manifest with delirium, psychosis and seizures. Deposition of immune complexes in the bone marrow cause cytotoxic effect on stem cells and overall immune complexes decrease the capacity of the bone marrow to produce blood cells. This results in decrease in white blood cells production, so this time leukopenia develops, also the production of platelets decrease, so thrombocytopenia develops, and the production of red blood cells decrease, as a result anemia develops. In addition to this, autoantibodies can bind to red blood cells or platelets and this can provoke their destruction by splenic macrophages. In case of platelets, immune thrombocytopenic purpura develops. In case of red blood cells, autoimmune hemolytic anemia develops. Autoimmune hemolytic anemia is by far more common complication of lupus. And the major features of autoimmune hemolytic anemia is increasing indirect bilirubin increase in lactate dehydrogenase and positive Coombs test. Also, immune complexes can deposit in pericardium, synovium and serosal layers. Deposition of immune complexes can cause severe damage to them. As a result, their permeability increase and inflammation develops. In case of pericardium, acute pericarditis develops. In case of synovium, synoviitis develops. The characteristic feature of synoviitis is that lupus usually affects two or more joints and inflammation of the synovium causes morning stiffness that lasts longer than 30 minutes and also joint becomes tender with palpation. Inflammation of the serosal layer causes pleural or pericardial effusion. Deposition of immune complexes together with activated T cells cause severe damage to the skin and to the mucosal layers. Basically, inflammation develops and inflammation causes destruction of keratinocytes. On the scalp, this can cause severe damage to hair follicles that results in non-scarring alopecia. In the oral cavity, damage to the mucosal layer manifests with oral ulcers 
and on skin initially subacute inflammation develops, subacute inflammation can progress into so-called discoid rash, or if acute inflammation develops, in this case it can cause malar rash or maculopapular rash. We call this condition acute cutaneous lupus. So here we see that skin injury occurs due to a lupus-induced immunological disruption. Initially, there are some predisposing factors, but disease remains silent. And when predisposing factors meet with provoking factors, excessive ultraviolet light, for example, can trigger lupus. In active phase, lupus can cause severe inflammation that affects multiple organs, including skin. On first image, we can see acute lupus, or we call this butterfly rash. On second image is subacute lupus, which is non-scarring. On third image, intermittent lupus. And on last image is discoid rash. As we see, the major difference between discoid rash and subacute lupus is scars. Discoid rash is scarring and subacute lupus non-scarring. In terms of laboratory diagnosis, lupus has a few characteristic features. First of all, it's autoantibodies. Antinuclear antibodies are the most sensitive but have low specificity. This means that if lupus is present, ANA will be positive. But the problem is that ANA is also positive in rheumatoid arthritis, scleroderma, dermatomyositis, and a bunch of other autoimmune disorders. So, it's non-specific marker. Antiphospholipid antibodies, it's a collective term. Two most common of them, it's cardiolipin antibodies and anti-beta-2 glycoprotein 1 antibodies. They are especially important in antiphospholipid syndrome. We have to know that anti-double-stranded DNA antibodies have high sensitivity and high specificity, which is unique. And the last type is anti-Smith antibodies. In addition to this, overactivation of complement system causes decrease in C3, C4 complement components, which is a specific feature of lupus. So we can determine antinuclear antibodies, antiphospholipid antibodies, overactivation of complement system causes low C3, C4 complement components, and also we can determine anti-double-stranded DNA antibodies and anti-Smith antibodies. One of the major features of lupus is LA cells, which are actually antigen-presenting cells that has consumed another cell. On this picture, we see antigen-presenting cell that consumed denaturated nuclear material of another cell. That's a real-life image of LA cell. Here we see the nucleus of consumed cell, and it's the nucleus of antigen-presenting cell. So it's basically a cell within the cell. The separate topic of the discussion is joint involvement in lupus. Lupus causes polyarthritis, which means that lupus affects multiple joints at once, mostly its small joints as hands, feet or wrist. Also lupus affects symmetrically, means that usually lupus affects the same joints on both sides. And also, lupus causes migratory arthritis, means that initially first joint is affected, then inflammation resolves, but the second joint becomes affected. But this time, inflammation can come back to the first joint. Lupus causes severe inflammation, and the more severe is the inflammation, the more prolonged is the morning stiffness. And important that morning stiffness improves with activity unlike osteoarthritis, for example. Lupus affects synovium, it causes synoviitis, that typically manifest with joint swelling and tenderness on palpation. Only in 10% of cases, lupus causes deformation of the joint, we call this condition Jacot's arthropathy. And important that lupus do not cause bone erosions, unlike rheumatoid arthritis. If lupus causes erosion, which is an exception, we call this state rupus. Here we see the subtypes of joint injury caused by lupus. In most cases, lupus causes non-deforming, non-erosive arthritis. So cartilage typically is not affected. In 10% of cases, lupus causes deforming arthritis. 
or we call this condition Jakut's arthropathy. In this case, deformations are present, but bone erosions are absent. And only in 3% of cases, bone erosions are present. We call this condition rheumatoid-like erosive arthritis. So because bone erosions are present, like in rheumatoid arthritis, we call this condition rupus. Here we see a pattern of joint injury caused by lupus. Lupus affects connective tissue. With inflammation, they become loose, and because of this, severe inflammation can cause joint deformities, simply because connective tissue cannot stabilize bone structures inside the joint. But bones and cartilage usually are not affected. And only in 3% of cases, inflammation is so severe that it causes destruction of cartilage and bone tissue, which is quite similar to rheumatoid arthritis, but it's a very rare condition. On these images, we see the same hand in different projections. As we see, there are multiple joint deformities. Practically all digits are affected, but as we see, interjoint space in most of the joints remains normal, which means that cartilage is not affected. Here we see a real-life photo of hands with severe deformities, and an X-ray of the same hands. In this case, there are multiple deformations of the joint on both hands. In clinical medicine, to diagnose lupus, a rheumatologist created lupus criteria. The first criteria is the presence of ANA, because as we know ANA is the most sensitive marker. The second criteria is fever as a sign of severe systemic inflammation. Lupus causes severe damage to tissues, damage to multiple tissues in the body creates pro-inflammatory state, and inflammation causes increase in temperature. The third criteria are related to bone marrow injury, and the fourth criteria is autoimmune hemolytic anemia. I recall that deposition of immune complexes in the bone marrow causes suppression of hematopoiesis that cause leukopenia, thrombocytopenia, and anemia. And also, because autoantibodies can bind to red blood cells, this can provoke autoimmune hemolysis of red blood cells by the spleen. The fifth group of criteria is related to central nervous system injury. Recall that lupus causes damage to the blood-brain barrier that ends up in neuronal death, and progressive injury to neural tissue causes delirium, psychosis, and seizures. The next group of criteria is related to skin and mucosal injury, and there are a lot of manifestations that can be related to lupus. So, as we know, lupus causes inflammation in the skin and mucosal layers. And most typically, on the scalp, it causes non-scarring alopecia, in oral cavity, oral ulcers, on skin, lupus can cause subacute cutaneous lupus or discoid rash. Acute cutaneous lupus with malar rash is also possible. The next group of criteria is related to polycerositis. In lupus, the position of immune complexes in the pericardium causes acute pericarditis. Deposition in synovium, synoviitis, deposition in serosal layer, pleural effusion or pericardial effusion. Also, because lupus affects glomeruli, one of the criteria is glomerulonephritis. Recall that deposition of immune complexes in the glomeruli cause glomeruli injury. We call this condition lupus nephritis. And the major feature of lupus nephritis is proteinuria. The last criteria are belongs to laboratory markers. It's the presence of autoantibodies and depletion of complement factors. So, the presence of antiphospholipid antibodies, anti-double-stranded DNA antibodies, and anti-Smith antibodies, all of them are the markers of lupus. So, if they are present, most probably it's lupus. In addition to this, we can determine low level of C3, C4 complement components due to the overactivation of complement. The most recent treatment guidelines states that hydroxychloroquine is absolutely essential component in treatment of lupus. So hydroxychloroquine is the first line drug in treatment of lupus. It's the most commonly used and the most effective medication in general. 
The problem with drugs as hydroxychloroquine, methotrexate, azathioprine, cyclophosphamide, mycophenolate, mofetil, is a broad spectrum of action. They are non-selective, and because of this, they have a huge amount of side effects. For example, hydroxychloroquine is antimalarial drug, but we also use it in treatment of lupus. The second essential component in treatment of lupus is glucocorticosteroids. Corticosteroids cause apoptosis of lymphocytes. Without lymphocytes, the production of antibodies decreases, complement activation decreases, and cytotoxic effect of tequilas will be less severe. All of this combined will prevent tissue injury. So, corticosteroids and hydroxychloroquine are two essential components in treatment of lupus. Nowadays, we have a modern selective agents, and because they are selective, they have a lesser amount of side effects. The first one is rituximab. Rituximab binds to CD20 receptor on B lymphocytes and triggers their apoptosis. With decrease in B lymphocytes, the production of autoantibodies decreases and complement activation decreases. This markedly decreases the severity of tissue damage. The second agent called belimumab. Belimumab binds to buff receptor on the surface of B lymphocytes and basically inactivates them. With an activation of B lymphocytes, the production of antibodies decreases and complement activation decreases. All of this could prevent tissue injury. The third agent is abatacept. Abatacept is a co-stimulation inhibitor. Basically, abatacept prevents activation of T helpers. The lesser is the amount of activated T helpers, the lesser will be the amount of activated B lymphocytes. Thereby, the production of autoantibodies will decrease, complement activation decrease, as a result tissue injury will decrease. Also, with inactivation of T helpers, stimulation of T killers decrease, and thereby the cytotoxic effect on tissues decrease. And the last agent is calcineurin inhibitor. Calcineurin inhibitor prevents activation of T helpers. With inactivation of T helpers, B lymphocytes become inactivated, thereby antibodies production and complement activation will decrease. And also T killers become inactivated. All of this could prevent tissue injury. Also, we have to know that lupus can manifest as antiphospholipid syndrome, especially during pregnancy. In antiphospholipid syndrome, the production of anticardiolipin antibodies and the production of anti-beta-2 glycoprotein 1 antibodies can cause massive thrombosis. Also, lupus can cause neonatal lupus, and one of the subtypes of lupus is drug-induced lupus, and the hallmark of this condition is the presence of antihistone antibodies.